I decided to talk about Hanukkah because next week there's a lot of programs uh, on Wednesday for, for the kids in school. So I uh, decided we're going to talk about Hanukkah this week. Next week we're going to have a Hanukkah vacation. The Rambam says in the third chapter of the Laws of Hanukkah, the Bayashani, and during the Second Temple when the Greek government ruled over the Jews. They made decrees against the Jewish people and they re- and they destroyed their religion. He doesn't explain that means what that means that he made that the nas- the, the the national lit- religion of Israel is Judaism. When the Greeks and the Hellenists took over they said Hellenism is the official religion. Like today in the United States, Christianity is the official religion. Uh, I'm not talking about the latest politics, but um, certainly that was a time that that was that was the founding fathers, and now the they made the official religion not not Judaism but Hellenism, and they did not allow them to involve themselves in Torah mitzvahs. They also took their money, and they took their daughters, and they went into the sanctuary, and they made, and they violated the holiness of the sanctuary, and they made the holy objects unholy, and they created great uh, anguish to the Jewish people because of them. And they pressured them, a great deal of pressure, until God had Rachmonis on them, and he saved them from their hands, and he protected them. Okay, so now, who saved the Jewish people? God. God had Rachmonis on them, and what did he do? He had... He did. He was Moshiach and Motzel them. He took the, he removed the aggressor, the aggressor, and he helped them overcome their feeling of being pushed down. Now, a couple. That's what the Rambam says. Now, a couple of lines later, he says, "The Gavru b'nei Chashmonoi hakohanim hagedolim," and the Hasmoneans, Hasmoneans, the sons of. High priests, killed the Hellenists, and they saved the Jewish people from Hellenism, from the from the from the Greek centurions, and they made a king from the among the Kohanim, and the and the Jewish royalty, Jewish uh, kingship reverted to Israel more than another 200 years until the final destruction of the Temple. The Rambam has said the most unbelievable contradiction in, in, in the same law, a couple... Who, who helped... Who, who saved us? Who saved the Jews? God of Israel saved the Jews. He had Rachmanus on them. He saved them. He was Moshia them, and Matzilam, and he restored their feeling of themselves. That's what he says. Three lines later he says, the Hasmoneans saved the Jews and restored their confidence and and eventually brought back the kingship to Israel for another 200 years. Who saved us? Was it the Hasmoneans? Hasmoneim? Or was it God? Which I can't tell you, this is such a contemporary issue here. Who's saving the Jews in Israel today? God is saving the Jews in Israel from the Arabs and the Shtochim, from the, the, the uh, existential threat, or, is, or the, or the uh, Israelis? Who's doing it, God or the Israelis? One thing, if God did do it, what is it said God did it. If God did it, what do you need them for? Are they doing it? God did it. They're just 
doing, they're just nothing. I mean, they're just the hand of God, like all the time. And yet the Rambam goes out of his way to say, the Israeli God saved us and the, and the Hashemunayim saved us. And by the way, Rashi and Chumash says the same thing. What do you think Rashi and Chumash is talking about the uh, the uh, Hanukkah? You know, Hanukkah was a little before the time of the Chumash. Let me read you Rashi and Chumash. It's a Rashi and Chumash. It's a fascinating Rashi. And regarding Levi, it said the, tum, the Urim Betumim belongs to you, the high priest. And the tribe was tested. And they... had a tremendous... they killed out their relatives when they destroyed the people who did the sin of the golden calf. They killed them out. And the law, they will instruct the Jewish people in law, and they'll use Keturus. And it says, Baruch Hashem Chelo. This is told in the, in the blessing to Levi in the Parsha Zosah Baruch Hashem Chelo. Levi should be blessed. Ufoa Yod of Tirzeh, and the action of, it, of his hands that should be accepted. Mechatz Mosnaim Komov. He strikes the loins of those that rose against him, and Misanov, and those that hate him in Yekumu. So, what is Baruch Hashem Chela? What is what is this blessing? So Rashi says like this: Baruch Hashem Chela, Pasuk Yudav, eleventh sentence. Ra. Moshe Rabbeinu saw that Asidim Chashmonoyu Bonov, the high priest and his children, would fight against the Yavonim, against the Greek centurions, and he davened for them. So Moshe Rabbeinu is davening to God, please save them. Baruch Hashem Chelo, God save them. They're going to be striking, they're going to have to fight trained soldiers. And there's very few of them. There was only 12 children of, of, of Hashmonoi. He only had 12 sons, Matasyo. The Lozer, and a Lozer who was one of the sons of, of Matasyo, he was connected Kamar Vovos. He himself killed many ten thousands. The, the minimum would have to be 20,000, but I think from Rashi it sounds like 30,000. What does it mean one man struck down 30,000 of the greatest soldiers in the world? The Greek centurions were great soldiers. What does it mean? I mean, God killed them. So what is he saying that Elazar did anything? God, God can kill as many as he wants. God can do everything. He's saying exactly like the Rambam. God saved us, and yet there was, they were empowered... The the Hasmoneans Hasmoneans were empowered themselves to God gave them the power to do it. So it was their power to do it. It wasn't the power of God. It was the power God empowered them, gave them the energy to do it. A little bit, I guess you could understand. They're fighting on their land, and if they're very fast, so they. He jumped from one place to another place, and they thought maybe in all directions this. He was he was murdering people, was killing the greatest soldiers in the world. It's, it really is incredible, but this was God gave him the power to do it. Baruch Hashem Chelo. It's a blessing to the, not the army of God. Baruch Hashem Chelo, the army of the, of Matasio. What does this mean? Who saves us? Us or God? Okay. I thought maybe I would get into the Parsha this week. 
you know, we find something in the Parsha was give us some indication. This is Parshas Vayeshev. Yosef is confronted by the wife of Potiphar. She was, she lifted up her eyes towards Joseph, the wife, and she said, and he refused, and he said to the wife of his master, behold, this is what he said, the words he actually said, behold, my master doesn't know, know what's going on in the house, whatever he, he is, he has in the house, he put in my hand, he gave me the trust, there's nobody more important in this household more than me. And he didn't hold back anything from me, only you, because you're his wife. How can I do something so terrible? So it's a great evil to him. You're asking me to sleep with you, and he says, he trusts me so implicitly, and he put me, he put everything in my hands. How can I violate that trust? And then he says, v'chotosi lelohim. And I'm violating, it's a sin under the Noahide law, it's adultery. There's 16 words before that in the sentence. I mean, there's 32 words are in the sentence how violated all the trust and, and everything, and how can I do it? It's a terrible thing. And there's two words on violating the Noahide laws. Why do you have to say 32 words? Uh, it's a violation. What are you asking me to do? I'm, I can't violate the Noahide laws. I'm not going to go against the Noahide laws. He observed the Noahide laws. So he says it. So why does he have 32 words first as a prelude that how can I do this? It's totally immoral and he trusts me and I can't violate a trust. And, and, and then he, and he concludes with two words. And it's, it's, a Noahide, it's a sin under Noahide laws. Let him just say it's a sin under Noahide laws. The Torah doesn't need extra words. The Torah is telling us an unbelievable thing. <coughs> the difference between a Jew and a Gentile is that we don't do things because they're right or wrong. That's not, it's a sin is not the reason I don't do it. It's the, I have to have the moral fiber and the character. The Torah, the, the mitzvahs are to build character. And I have to not want to do, violate adultery, not because I'm doing a sin, but because adultery is such a betrayal, at least in this case, such a betrayal of trust that I can't do it. Being a moral person, having values, is the, is the, is the goal of what is a Jew has to have values. It's not that the Jew has to do what's right. He has to be a moral person. Unfortunately, we, a lot of times, we see this as an, this is what it should be. I'm not saying that all Jews do. There's a lot of Jews that, put it like this, are the Jews that are religious that you wouldn't lend money to? Then you understand they're not Jews of moral character. Anybody that you won't trust to lend money because he's not going to pay you back, then that's not, not a person who's doing what a Jew is. A Jew's not somebody who puts on towels and film and looks religious and keeps Shabbos. A Jew is somebody that has the ultimate moral character. And the ultimate moral character is uh, if I borrow money from somebody, I have to pay him back. Or I can't do anything that's a betrayal of a trust. I just can't betray a trust. A Jew has to have character. The philosophy of the Jew is not religion. It's to build my moral status. That's what this parsha teaches us. And this is the message I want to talk about Hanukkah, of what it means to be a Jew. What it means to be a Jew 
is that I have to be a person of the highest moral character, and that has to be an example to the whole world. That's what our responsibility is, to exemplify mor moral character, not to exemplify <coughs> how religious I am. The three mitzvahs that he came to, that the Greeks came to overthrow were Shabbos, Chodesh, Rosh Chodesh, Shabbos, and Bris Mila. Why did they pick this? Okay, Shabbos is a very important thing. Shabbos is our special covenant with God. I can understand they took that. I can understand... Bris Mila is our special covenant with God. But what is this business of Rosh Chodesh? Rosh Chodesh, that, uh, that the Jews don't set the calendar. They don't set the calendar. You know, well, who cares if the, they set, the Jews set the calendar or the Goyim set the calendar? If you, use the, if you use the Jewish calendar, you use it. What difference does it make? Why is that such a big, important factor by the Hellenists, that they want to uproot the Jewish calendar. In fact, Rashi starts off in Chumash, an incredible Rashi. Rashi starts off in Chumash that the Torah should not have started from Bereshus. So you would think if the Torah, because it's not a book of mitzvahs, so if I asked you, where do you think the Torah should start, what would you say? Give the first mitzvah. Give the first mitzvah. Torah. Where should it start? If it's not a book of, if it's a book of mitzvahs, where should it start? The first mitzvah. <laughs> you would start with Har Sinai. We're only obligated to the mitzvahs because of, of Mount Sinai. That's not what Rashi says. Rashi says it should start with Achodesh Hazelochem Rosh the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh. What an unbelievably difficult thing! The place to start the Torah is Rosh Chodesh. It's also interesting that one of the mitzvahs that women have taken on themselves is which mitzvah? Rosh Chodesh. Women don't do, the custom is that women don't do work on Rosh Chodesh in their house. They, they don't work on Rosh Chodesh. The women are not supposed to work. They, not that they had not allowed to. They, that's something they adopted on themselves. What, what is so significant about Rosh Chodesh? We don't work on Rosh Chodesh. You know, the rest of the, the rest of the month we work as hard as we can. But Rosh Chodesh, we don't work. <coughs> What's so wrong about working on Rosh Chodesh? It's a fascinating principle here. Yaakov Avinu takes Rochel. The Torah gives us a very interesting language. And he worked for how many years did he work for Rochel? Seven years. And you know what it was in his eyes like? A few days. I mean, a guy's waiting to get married. Seven days is like seven years, but seven years isn't like seven days. I'll ask my grandson <laughs> that makes it. What is the Torah telling us that it was like, it was like seven, it was like a few days in his eyes. What does that mean? I mean, Torah has to talk an emotional thing. What's the Torah saying? Yaakov wasn't a normal person. He's working for seven years, and it's like seven days to get married. It should be seven days. It should be like seven years. Well, I can ask Sarah. She knows the answer to that question too. <laughs> seven days is seven years. Not 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 uh, seven years is seven days. The answer is like this. <laughs> if you're the master of time, he's building a relationship. He's trying to build a relationship. He's working for her that he's given her the feeling that you're somebody that I want you to know how much I care about you. I'm working for you. That gives her a tremendous feeling of what? Importance. <coughs> he's marrying her. He didn't have to, he volunteered to work seven years. Lovin didn't ask him to work. He volunteered to work seven years. Means he, what message is he trying to give to, to Rachel? I love you. you. It's worth it for me to work for you for seven years. It's worth it for me. And, I, and he, therefore he's building a relationship. 
when someone's building a relationship, then he's using his time in a very important way. And when you use time, you become the master of time, then time passes very fast. You know, I don't know what the best example for for women is, but for boys, well, you remember your brothers are playing football or soccer, and your mother says, "Come on, time to eat supper." And what do they say? Five minutes. I know, you know, I, I'll be in later. I, you know, I'll skip supper tonight because they feel so empowered by playing soccer. They feel so good about it that they don't want to. They don't want to come and eat. eat. You, you don't. You don't even really want to eat. You're so excited about what you're doing. You don't want to eat. I don't know if girls get that much into into sports, but everybody knows this feeling. Everybody knows the feeling. When you, somebody's making a lot of money and making deals and deals, and his wife says, come in time to eat supper. Honey, I'm, I'm every minute that you, I can't take time, so I'm making calls, and every call they're buying whatever I'm selling. It's unbelievable. I don't want to bother. I, I, I have no time to eat now. You think the person is hungry? There's a feeling of, of when you have a tremendous feeling of accomplishment, food becomes a minor, a minor thing. What it's saying is like this, or tennis becomes a minor, tennis becomes a major thing, and uh, food becomes unimportant. There's a tremendous feeling. The Torah is telling us like this, that a Jew has to be the feeling, he has to accomplish. You have to be totally involved in accomplishment. You can't, you're not supposed to let your days pass by. You have to have a feeling that you accomplish every day you get up to accomplish and you're going to accomplish things and therefore that's a tremendous <coughs> a tremendous feeling of fulfillment and that's what they wanted to take away from the Jews because the Jews by observing Rosh Chodesh like Rashi says we live in the reality of we are masters of time. In fact it's very interesting at Mount Sinai what happened? The Jews accepted the Torah. And 40 days later, they did the sin of the golden calf. Why did they do the sin of the golden calf? Because they made a mistake as to what you start counting from. Moshe went up during the day, and they said, that's day one, and at night will be day two. And they made a mistake. That didn't count. It didn't count till nighttime. Why? What's the difference between day and night? Why, why didn't it count? He went up today, so when he comes down, the middle of the day is a whole day. So when he went up, it should be a day. The answer is like this. At during, our sages say, how did Moshe know when it was day and when it was night at, when he was in the mountain? He's inside a mountain. How did he know when it was day or night? He's with God inside the mountain. So it says that when they learn Chumash, it was daytime. When they learned Gemara, it was nighttime, which means when you're using your head, it's nighttime. When you're when you're when you're active and producing, it's nighttime. When you use your mind, it's nighttime. They wanted to count the day one. They misunderstood that the read that can count because God is interested in giving us the Torah not just to give us mitzvahs, but to give us a feeling of accomplishment. And using our head is is our feeling of accomplishment, and therefore that didn't count. The day didn't count, only nighttime when a person is really accomplishing. A person has to feel a tremendous feeling of accomplishment. And when you have a tremendous feeling of accomplishment, time, time passes. That's what Rosh Chodesh is, to give us that tremendous feeling of accomplishment. And that's why the women are so locked into Rosh Chodesh. Just like a woman is, is free from, from doing mitzvahs. Why? Because she has to take care of her, her husband. How long does it take to take a lulav? Ten seconds? You mean you don't have ten seconds? What, are you a slave to your husband? He doesn't give you ten seconds off that you, that you don't have time to take a lulav? Or to listen to the show for 30 colors is maybe 15 seconds. What is that? You're slaves to your husbands? No, a woman is constantly thinking about what she wants to do for her husband. You know, a boss never has a minute off. A boss is always thinking about what's better for the business, what's a better way to run a business. The, the Pusik Shlomo Mel says a, a, week, a, um, a workman has 
sl- sl- sleeps peacefully. Mesuka shina ove, and he sleeps. It's very sweet the sleep of a workman, but the the employer. His wealth doesn't give him the opportunity to sleep. What's that mean? Because somebody who's making money, he's not thinking about sleeping. What does he think about all the time? Making more money. He's always thinking about it. And that's what it is. A woman is always thinking about her family. How can I improve it? How can I do better for the kids? How can I do better for my husband? How am I to be able to do my, my responsibilities better? And therefore, that's what it means that a woman, they took Rosh Chodesh on. That's what the Greeks didn't want. The Greeks didn't want the Jewish value that we have to be masters of time. We have to be. We don't. We don't just. We, we don't live in the vac in the being affected by time. We have to be masters. We have to create our own destiny in the world. A Jew has to create his destiny. That's what the victory of Hanukkah is. We have to create our destiny. Not that we have to. Just go along here and take, take whatever pleasure we can out of the world. It has to be that we have to create our destiny, and and that's what and that's what a Jew is. And like as like Yosef Atzadik says, I have to I have to be a moral person. I have to have real values. I have to be I have to change myself and make myself a better human being. That's our goal here. You have to, the Torah was given, and, and it should have started, the Torah should have started in the book of the mitzvahs with HaChodesh HaZeloch and Rosh Chodoshim, because the idea of sanctifying time is being, being the master of time, and therefore I will constantly work and constantly accomplish things. And that's the notion too. God saves us, but God empowers us to save the Jewish people too. So the state of Israel, it's a big mistake for anybody to think that they're not, they're saving us. God saves us, but what God did is he empowered them to save us also, and therefore we owe them an enormous sense of appreciation. They're saving us from Iran, they're saving us from the Arabs, and the Shtochem, and the Jerusalem, and Yafo, and also from, from international threats to our existence. They're saving us. We owe we owe them an enormous amount. And appreciation is a very high value in the Torah. So it's important to understand who we owe appreciation. Not just we thank God. We thank God. I have to thank the people that are actually saving me too, that they're actually contributing to my saving. God empowered them, gave them the power. He gave them the power to do it. As, as Moshe Rabbeinu says, God gave one one. Jewish soldier, the ability to defeat 30,000 of the greatest soldiers in the world. And it's very close to that. I don't know exactly what the numbers are in the state of Israel, but it's an unbelievable thing that if so few people were able to, to accomplish and save us, we owe it to them. We owe them appreciation. Of course, we owe God appreciation too, but we owe them too appreciation. And our whole feeling of being Jews is to really begin to win. I say, this is the message of Hanukkah. We have to appreciate each other. We have to appreciate our brethren, how much they do for us, how much they empower us, how much they've been empowered by God to help us. And that's a tremendous blessing we have that people care so much about us. It's, um, you know, the Jews who came over in the 20s, the first thing they did, they came from Europe, they had nothing themselves. But they came over in the 20s, and the next Jews don't come over till later on. They, have, they had free loan societies. A Jew comes over, he doesn't have a way of making the money, we'll loan him money. He'll be able to start a business. Have free burial societies. He needs a place to be buried. This is, this is the, the Jews who came over in the 20s, in the, in, where America had a trafe in a Medina. Where it really had very little Judaism. And there's very little things they could do, but one thing they could always do is remember to help other Jews. And especially the Jews that came over later, they were constantly committed to help them. And that was a, a huge good feeling. You got off the boat, and someone was going to lend you money to, to be able to start, start a, a business is a tremendous gift. The Jewish community loves the rest of so the 
re reality of a Jewish community is an unbelievable thing. How we have such a, a gift from God that our community loves us and it's such an important priority to understand that this is our highest value to make sure the community survives and the community thrives. I'll just tell you over one last Rashi. Remember Yaakov Avinu meets his uh, Esau and he says he divides it into two camps and if Esau atta attacks one of the camps, the other camp should run away. So Rashi says like this, Rashi says, the, the surviving camp will be saved. Because he, he gets waylaid, Esau, and the other people escape. So Rashi says, Al -korchach, against his will. So the Nachmanides in his commentary says, what do you mean against his will? That's the whole goal, to be saved. That's the whole goal. He saying it's like this, an incredible thing. What is the Israeli army doing? What does any army do? You're in a war, and you have family, and somebody's wounded. What are you going to do? You're going to leave them on the battlefield? got to take them with you. you got to take them with you, right? There's no soldier. You're going to leave a soldier. Here the Torah is saying that's not true. You have to leave your family. That's your brothers there. You're dividing in half. There's some brothers you're going to, you have to leave them there. It's against your will. Why? Because building the Jewish people is the highest prior priority of Jews, is building the Jewish people, even higher than family. What's important about your family is because your family is the ones that can help you build the Jewish community the most. But saving your family is the not the goal here. The goal is building the Jewish people. And that's what we all have to know for ourselves, too. That it's true we have to take care, of, responsible for the Jewish community, but we also have to realize our family is the, our greatest contribution we can make to the Jewish community today. The one you'll have the most influence on if you're involved in the community. How do you, if you want other people to get involved, okay, you're an example and other people see that, they learn from you. But who's who's your best who's your best student that's going to be learned from you the most? Your children. So saving your children or high prioritizing your children is because the children themselves will be your greatest contribution you can do for the community. That's the practical, the takeaway from this. That family is not, you know, some people, they, they get involved in the community and they neglect their, their children. That's wrong. So what, you're supposed to take your children and then neglect the community? No. It's the best thing you can do for the community is the ones you can make the greatest asset of the community is your children. Your <laughs> children will be those that will contribute the most to the community. You know, from your own children. That's true. That's true. They learn from you, be involved in the community, and therefore they become involved in the community. It's not that you're taking care of your family. That's the way you take care of the Jewish community. This is what Hanukkah, the message of Hanukkah is that the Jewish people, and that's the, se the secret of our survival, the Jewish community is the goal of Jews. We're the only nation, as Professor Albright said, he was a professor in archaeology when I was in, uh, in Baltimore in Hopkins. Uh, I didn't ever have him, but he was there and he said like this. He said, there's never been in the history of mankind a person that was on his land and was off the land for 400 years and they came back, except Abraham. They went down to Egypt, the Jews, and Jacob, and they came back 400 years later when we went into Israel. And there's never been a country that's been away from their land for a couple of thousand, for a, uh, a thousand years and came back, except for the Jews in the temp time of the Second Temple. They were thrown into, into Golis, and they were in Persia, and afterwards they came back, even though they had lived among the Goyim for 70 years. 
And lastly, there's never been a country for, for a few thousand years that's been away for their, from their homeland and came back, except the Jewish people in 1948. They've been away from their homeland for 2,000 years, and they came back. Because he's just pointing out as a fact, I'm saying the insight is because to the Jews, being where Jews are, our commitment to the, our, our home, national homeland is where we live as Jews, or we live as a community. And that's our whole goal. <coughs> we live as a community. The Greeks, the Irish, you know, they're not dying to go back to Ireland. The blacks in the United States are not going to, their goal is to, to return to, to Africa. It has nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with it. Our goal as a Jew is eventually to go back to Israel at the right time. And that's just because I want to be reunited and I want to live with my family again. And that's what our strength as Jews is. We have family. And that's the victory over, over the Hellenists. They want to destroy the idea of what a Jewish family is, a Jewish nation. And to us, a Jewish nation is just a family. And a family... The root of the word family, which I think I said last week, just that point, the root of the family comes to the word shifcha, which means maidservant. We all serve each other. Everybody in the family serves each other. We're all service of our brethren, of the extended Jewish family. And please, God, we'll all take the values and remember it's not about being religious. It's about being caring for other Jews and committed to other Jews. Happy Hanukkah.